Hey, what's up guys? This is Marseille, AKA The Property Pastor, coming at you with another amazing video. Hey, look, our mission here at The Property Pastor is to unlock the secrets of wealth building through real estate investing. And today I wanna talk to uh, some of the newcomers to real estate investing and give you just an overview of the four major types of, uh, of financing. So basically when you go to get a deal, one of the biggest questions I get is, hey, where do I get the money? How do I find money? How do I finance my deals? This, that, and the third. So I want to give you a basic overview of what the four major types are. We're going to kind of give a basic description. Then we'll talk about uh, how do you get it. We'll talk about the pros and cons of each method, and, uh, and we'll walk our way through. So really, you know, before we jump in, I want to remind you guys to make sure you like and subscribe to our page. That way you're going to get uh, hipped into all the new content that we're putting out each and every week to help you on your journey, help build you up, help you to add to your toolbox, and, uh, and to give you what you need so you can be successful. People have helped me, and my mission here is to help you as well, and, uh, and, and that's what we aim here to do at The Property Pastor. So let's take a look. The very first... Um, So let's take a look real quick. The very first uh, financing method is conventional financing. So conventional financing is going to be basically through a bank. Right? You're going to find that at your local bank. Uh, that could be your credit union. That could be you know Wells Fargo, Wachovia, uh, any of those types of folks, SunTrust and whatnot. Right? So a bank is going to be your major financing portion um, for conventional loans. Right, so with the conventional loan, you're going to typically put down a 20 to 25 percent down payment. With this financing type, you're going to go through underwriting, and a basic method. Right, how do you get it? Right, you you have to prove your credit history proof of funds taxes income sources DNA samples, you know, whatever you can think of the bank wants it. They want to prove your credit worthiness. They want to prove that you are not a risk um, if they're going to give you money. Right. So as I've said in other videos, a bank rate, typically we're actually at some of our lowest interest rates uh, in the past, you know, several decades. Uh, right now, you can get a, a mortgage loan in your name for, you know, three, three to five percent easily on the commercial side. If you get a little bit higher, you know, buy more properties, you know, you can be anywhere from five to seven, even upwards of eight percent right around these days. So basically, like I said, you're going to get your conventional financing through a bank. Um, you're going to have 20 to 25 percent down payment that you'll be dealing with. You got to go through the underwriting process. When you go to apply, you have to basically fill out an application. You go down to your local bank online, et cetera, et cetera. They're going to run a credit history on you. They're going to check where you work. Uh, they're going to check how much income you're making. They're going to check your all the assets you have. Uh, it's a very lengthy uh, process. It, it's very it's a lot of diligence when you're going through the underwriting process. You got to submit tax returns. You got to show that, hey, I got enough money for the 20 percent down payment. Where is it coming from? And then you also have to have uh, viable income sources that can be rental income. That can be investment income that can be uh, from your your, beg your regular day job. You know, all these different sources. The bank wants to know where your where your income sources are. So what are the benefits of this kind of this kind of financing? So I'm going to say the benefits are it's the most common. And well known slash well known this is going to be traditional for MLS properties hopefully they all can see that and read my handwriting uh, so basically you know most people know about you know going to a bank when you bought your first home you went probably went to a bank you went to Wells Fargo you applied uh, for that loan whatnot and you know after you fill in all that stuff out after going through the lengthy process basically you were financed you were able to purchase your first home so if you're working with a realtor right you're you're, you're going out you're looking on the MLS you're working with a realtor traditionally the conventional financing mechanisms are going to be the way you're going to go from that perspective also another great benefit is that you can apply if you're uh, you can use your FHA, which is just your first home loan buyer, your first home, first time home buyer program, on house hacking, which is going to give you 
a 3% down payment, which is nice. You know, if you're getting into house hacking and things like that, you're just starting out. Uh, one of the nice parts about conventional financing is that if you're doing a house hack, you can go in for 3% down, very low money, very low down payment, and come out with an investment property. So I've done another video on house hacking if you're in your 20s and 30s. I definitely recommend you check that out. It'll definitely be beneficial to you. But then what are the cons? What makes uh, conventional financing so difficult? What makes it um, not so attractive? So the very first thing, the very first con is going to be um, the length of time. One of the cons is the length of time. So it can take 30 to 60 days to close uh, through your lender or to finish that whole process uh, because there's so much diligence that they're doing. You got to submit tax returns. You can't spend any money. You know, they're like, hey, don't spend anything for the next 30, 60 days, basically, because we don't want to. Uh, change your credit we don't want any things that to, to basically cause underwriting to fall through so uh, it can be very very time consuming there's also some limits to lending so many lenders will only allow you to do four deals uh, with conventional financing so in your name or whatnot you can really only do about four deals so that's going to become very restrictive over time there's different um, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae guidelines that basically limit that from four to ten deals so if your financial goals are beyond four to ten deals conventional financing is not going to be the way to go so from a negative side You've got the amount of time, you've got the limits to lending, and then also you can be limited by credited his credit history. Limited by credit history. So if you are trying to get financed and you don't have good credit, it's very difficult to do your first deal with a conventional bank. You can't just go into Wells Fargo and say, hey, I got this great deal. I want you to fund it. They're, and, I'm, and my credit is a, you know, 500 or whatever the case might be. If you got bad credit, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to find a deal through conventional loans. Um, one thing I did forget to mention on the pro side, though, is that they got some of the best rates. I did kind of talk about 3 to 5%. So great rates, right? So great rates or access to money. Great rates on money. Forgot about that one. Don't want to forget about it. But while it's got the you know the the, the greatest rates, also you you know you got to have great credit as well. So if you don't have good credit, and uh, and then the other part of it is probably from a from a negative standpoint is the higher down payment. So a bank is going to need twenty to twenty five percent down payment. If you don't have that, well. The bank's not going to work with you so that makes that pretty restrictive and pretty difficult to do um so on the con side you got time you got limits and lending you've also got limited by your own credit history and then last but not least the high down payment amount on the next one we're going to take a quick look at hard money so i'm going to erase real quick and we're going to jump right into uh, hard money so next we're going to talk a little bit about hard money lending now hard money lenders uh typically are going to what a, what a hard money lender actually is they are a lending institution who will basically provide upfront cost quickly for deals and they are investor friendly. They are investor friendly. So a lot of people who flip houses, they will use hard money lending. Folks just getting started in a business will use hard money lending when they don't have a lot of access to cash, you know, and things of that nature because they've got a great deal, but they don't have funds. So if you've got a great deal and you don't have funds, sometimes a hard, a hard money lender may be the way to go. There are also other ways, you know, in terms of credit cards and things like that, but we're not going to get uh, into that one on this particular video. I just want to kind of cover the four major, uh, the four major areas of, uh, of finding funds for your deal. So how do you get access to hard money funds? So hard money lenders are, are pretty much all over because they're very lucrative and there's a lot of investors out here. So basically, how do you get it? You know, you're going to still do an app apply, 
All right, so you go to apply with your hard money lender. You're typically gonna find them through other investors, REIs and meetups, networking contacts. So for example, when I talk about REIs uh, and meetups, so REIs are just uh, other real estate investors, uh, but local meetups. So if you go and literally just Google real estate and real estate investing meetup, you'll typically find in your area that there is somebody either meeting up at a Panera, at a local restaurant, you know, at some interval. I know that some of the ones we have in my local area, they'll meet up once a month and just different real estate investors who are there for networking purposes. A big part of real estate investing is who you know. It's not you. It's not a one man one man show. You, you can't just do it all yourself. So if you go and you find other uh, other investors, they typically are going to have access or know private money lenders. You can also just Google, I mean, a hard money lender rather, not private money, but a hard money lender. You can actually just Google a hard money lender. Um, I wouldn't recommend you do that, but you can Google one and you can find them that way, that way as well. If you're a member of Bigger Pockets, they have a pretty extensive network of hard money lenders that you can tap into as well. Um, so there's a lot of ways to, uh, to find them. Now, like I said, they're going to typically underwrite you. They're going to want to see most of your strength here is going to be on the deal. So Whereas with a conventional, the lender is looking at primarily you. They are also looking at the deal. They want to understand basically what they call a DSCR, uh, which is a debt service coverage ratio. Uh, and that's basically your ability to pay the bills based on the income on the property. But when you're dealing with a hard money lender, the hard money lender is primarily looking at the strength of your deal more so than your credit worthiness. So you got to have a strong deal. They're going to underwrite that and then determine whether or not they want to fund your deal. Now, what are the pros to hard money lenders? Hard money lenders are quick. Quick access to cash. So if you are a house flipper, time is everything because if you are flipping homes, you getting to the to the deal is, is is everything. If you don't get there quickly, someone else may beat you to the punch. So being able to find your deals, have your funds in place, that's what it's all about. So with a hard money lender, also there is a low down payment. You may be looking at five to 10%, depending on the hard money lender, you may even be able to do better than that. Um, so from that standpoint, Hard money lending is convenient. It's basically the most convenient, one of the most, excuse me, one of the most convenient terms or ways to find funds in real estate investing. Now, what are the cons? I know this sounds really good. You're like, okay, I can, they're not going to worry about my credit. Uh, I got quick access to cash. I got a low down payment. Where's the catch, right? Where's the catch? So on the con side, the cost of borrowing is very high. Cost to borrow. Is high so from an interest rate perspective from an interest rate perspective so I talked about conventional lending basically with a conventional loan you're looking at three to five percent if you're doing uh, commercial you know it might be a little bit higher five to seven something to that effect um, but if you're looking at hard money lending your rates are going to be anywhere I will say I've seen them as low as nine percent and as high as fourteen percent plus points plus points so points are just origination fees that you pay up front as a percentage of the loan so you know basically they'll take the whole total loan amount and say i'm going to charge you this many points on that loan and you got to pay that up front in addition um, to the in addition to the overall uh, interest rate that you're paying which is also very high so from the con standpoint you know that's that's really where you're looking at so hard money lending is it's convenient, but you're going to pay for it. You know, I believe it. I found it. There's, re there's really not a whole lot in life that's free, um, you know, other than the intangible things like, you know, family and love, which matter the most. But when you start talking about things of substance, you're not going to get much for free. So hard money lenders typically are going to cost you a lot more money, but people use them every day as a reason they're in business because sometimes people find a great deal, especially if you're flipping houses, you can find a deal that's extremely, you can buy it very low 
you know, fund your, your rehab costs, which is another con another pro of this, right? You can get all your re rehab costs funded. Um, and then after it's all done, you can turn that property around very quickly. Many flippers are looking at three to three months to a year that they're turning their property around, paying off this high interest rate really fast and cashing out and making a lot of money. So that's where hard money lending becomes lucrative. But like I said, if you don't have a strong deal, you can really lose out with a hard money lender. So that's what hard money lending looks like. Uh, let's erase real quick, and then we're going to jump over into private money, one of my favorite subjects. All right, so private money in the private market, right? So a private money uh, lender can be, you know, a bunch of different things. You can be a professional private money lender. Basically, what happens is there is no bank involved. So this is a... Uh, this is lending that occurs outside of financial institutions. Institutions. All right, hopefully I spelled that right. All right, so this can be individuals who lend their cash. To investors. Now, like I said, some people are actually that's what that's all they do. They be, they have become private money lenders. They've got it could be a massive inheritance. They could have been formed. They, sometimes they're former investors who have have a lot of cash but still want to deploy that money, um, but they don't want to have the headache of managing property. So they'll just become a bank basically. So when you talk about private money, you are essentially becoming a bank. Now, how do you how do you get? How do you get access to private money lenders? And this is one of the, some folks call it the holy grail of real estate investing. Because once they begin to tap into private money, they have, you know, they're using what they call OPM, which is other people's money. And the nice part about private money is that, you know, doing deals over time and building credibility, you kind of generate additional uh, funds and you don't have to worry about the bank. So that's a phenomenal thing. I didn't really go into all the pain and suffering from dealing with banks, but it is not a fun process. So um, how, do you, how, do you get, uh, pri how do you get access to private money? So this is big in networking, right? So people who are what they consider high income individuals like doctors, um, let's see, doctors, lawyers, dentists, etc. These are great candidates to become private money lenders. And every one of us knows someone like that. We all know a doctor, we know a lawyer, we know a dentist. We know people who have, you know, a, a pretty good wage, a pretty good income. Um, and in that, they need to employ that capital, right? Because they don't have the time to go and invest like you and me, but they have the funds. So typically in real estate investing, you're going to be limited by something, right? You're either going to be limited by knowledge, you're going to be limited by time, you may be limited by money. But when all of these things come together, you are able to create win-wins. Now, who would not like to be a bank, right? So if you think about it, your, uh, your savings account is making you maybe 0.25%. I mean, I, that's really what, what I see normally. So if you've got your money in a savings account, you're basically, you know, you're losing because the cost of inflation is 2 to 3%. So having your money over in a bank account is not really doing much for you. Now, let's say, for example, that person takes their same amount of money and they put it in the stock market. But, you know, you, the market cycles go up and down. So real estate becomes a very um, it becomes a very attractive uh, place to, to park your money, because with real estate investing, you go in and you basically set terms. Right. So, you know, I work with private money lenders and I give them a fixed rate, which regard, regardless of what uh, their property does, they're going to get their money. And the property is typically going to be secured against that property. So it's basically a, a tangible asset that they can loan money against. And if something happens to the performance of the asset, they take the asset, basically. So basically, with, with, a, uh, with private money, networking is key. Um, and how do you get it? You know, a lot of folks, what I recommend is you set up a self-directed IRA, which basically allows that person to fund their own retirement. Uh, and in doing so, you know, they, they avoid a lot of the tax, you know, the, a, a lot of the gains that they would incur from taxes. They'll just put that in there and hold on to it for later. But then some people also, they will also just lend outright as well. So just basically, um, you know, how to get it. And then essentially it would be a promissory note. 
right? So you would set up a promissory note against that particular property or against that project, so to speak. Um, there's it's it's very creative, and that's one of the pros to it, right? So one of the things I'm going to say from a pro to private money is very creative. So, and what I mean by that is you can set your own terms. If you want to loan, they want to loan you money for one percent. They want to loan it for ten percent. They want to loan it for thirty percent. It's totally up to you. You know, the terms are totally negotiable, and, and that's the wonderful part about it because it's not regulated by the same uh, government regulations that you know conventional loaning, conventional loans fall under. So, uh, you can be creative in terms. Uh, and what I mean by terms, like I said, is the rate. Actually, it'd be better if I write it. it says rate. Uh, length, etc. Some people will lend private money with no down payment. So the cost to borrow is low, typically. The cost to borrow is low. There is not based on credit. And I would say limited underwriting, depending on where you get it. Limited underwriting. So there's a lot of benefits to private money. You know, if you can find a private money source, that is cash that you can create a win-win situation. And that's probably the biggest benefit. And I think a lot of a big part of real estate investing is creating win-wins. You know, basically if the investor wins, the lender wins. Everybody wins, you know, some a lot of times we look at negotiation as if hey, I'm gonna take it all and you're gonna get nothing But if you can create a win-win for a private money lender and allow them to be a bank Basically instead of them getting 0.25% on their money down there to getting anywhere from five eight ten percent on their money They're extremely happy and you're also happy because you didn't have to go and deal with the bank You don't have the four to ten loan limits, you know all of that kind of stuff You're not worried about your they're not they're not asking you, you know Let me see your tax returns and all that kind of stuff you know, just depending on how you set it up, who you set it up with, I think you'd be extremely creative and extremely flexible. What are some of the negatives, though? On the negative side, um, I think private money lenders can be a little bit more difficult to find. I'm not saying they're hard to find. I'll say harder to find. You can't just walk up to a person. You know, there's not, you know, there are private money lenders out there, but sometimes the the institutional private money lenders or the formal private money lenders are actually more like private or they're more like hard money lenders in disguise. But I'm talking about the folks that are doctors, lawyers and all that kind of stuff. So some of the some of the cons can be kind of difficult to find that. Right. So also it is a harder. Harder to convince. To loan. Up front. So most people are extremely skeptical. You know, if you get somebody knocking on your door or calling you and saying, hey, I got this great, I got this great deal for you. You know, give me a hundred thousand dollars. They're like, yeah, have a nice day. I'm gonna slam the door right in your face. And that's what sometimes we, you know, you may look like if you're going and talking to a person about lending you money. So they can be a little bit harder to find up front, but once you establish their relationship, once you build that trust, you build that rapport and you show your track record, because I think a lot of one of the bigger things about private money is that they're not really they are investing in you. You know, they're looking at what you can bring to the table. You know, for example, like I have a, a, a lender package that I send to people when I start talking to them and basically just goes through and it tells them, OK, here are the number of deals that I've done. These are pictures of the properties. Here's the financials. Here's everything. I'm an open book. You come see it for yourself. Here is an actual deal that you will be investing in. Here's how it's performed over time. And then that way they can actually see my tracker, my track record and have some level of confidence before they go and just stroke a check. Right. So but, it, but again, it can be kind of hard to break through that barrier up front. And that's why it's all about the networking. And what happens is, you know, what I found is that once I meet one private money uh, person, they begin to do deals with me and lend money. We finished that deal. I paid them back, cashed them out or whatever. And they're like, all right, when's the next one? Or they tell their friends and family or whatever that looks like, you know, and, and, that, and that's a big part. Right. So but I would say another con is borrowing money from friends and family. A lot of people say stay away from this like the plague. 
And, and that depends on your circumstance. You know, if you do borrow that kind of money from a relative, now if you're doing a self-directed IRA, there are some rules and regulations that you have to follow. You can't just, you know, there's what they call lineal uh, ascendance and descendants that you can't borrow money from a self-directed IRA, but that's another video for another time. But if you're borrowing money from friends and family, it can get dicey. If that deal for some reason goes south, you know, they want to they they want to ask you tons of questions. You know, it, it, it can be a little bit dicey. Right. And as an investor, you have to treat private money just like I mean, more importantly than your own money, because if you don't, you know, it's not just play money. It's not fake. Right. So you have to take care of your investors as a private when, when you're dealing with private money. So, again, I love private money. It's one of my favorite things um, that I'm going to jump into some of the creative functions here. I like them, too. Uh, but basically, like I say, private money is fantastic. When you hit when you start getting to six properties, 10 properties, et cetera, et cetera, you, your cash flow that you're generating every month sometimes is not enough to be a down payment for your next deal. So you will hit a wall and you've got to start using other people's money. And that's where private money really kicks in and helps you to continue to grow and also to scale your business. So um, next, we're going to talk a little bit about creative financing, about creative financing. So. All right, so in under creative financing, there's tons of things you can do. There's seller financing, there's subject to financing, there's lease option, there's wraparound mortgages. There's there are so many different things that you can do creatively to make deals work. So, but I'm going to primarily just talk about seller financing because that's what I know the most about. So in a seller financing, essentially the owner of a property will carry the note and basically act as a bank and act as a bank. So you'll set up a promissory note, this, that, and the third. In it, it will specify the terms, it'll specify you know, the length of the agreement, all that kind of stuff. But basically the property itself is you know it becomes a collateral this that and the third and the seller instead of going to the bank and getting uh, a note the seller basically says i am now the bank you will buy the property from me and instead of you getting a note and cashing me out basically we eliminated the middleman and the original seller is now the bank so in it you know you set up a amortization schedule every month you'll pay money this that and the third um and that's kind of how that would work so how do you get it first of all you have to find a property and seller financing works primarily through properties that are owned free and clear. Find a free and clear property. And you might be saying, well, who has paid off their house? It's like you, most people think that the percentage is actually a lot bigger than you would think. It's actually, I believe it's about 30% of people own their homes. Now, you can find seller financing through, I mean, excuse me, you can find properties that are owned free and clear from folks who have and basically equity searches. So if you go on list source, you can customize your field and say, hey, is this is this house even have a note? There's a lot of ways to figure out if that home is owned free and clear. But a, a lot of that comes through the negotiation process. So as you're talking to a person and you find out, you know, that, that, that a person owns a property free and clear, seller financing is actually a pretty cool tool because what will happen, like I talked about earlier, creating win-win. So that seller could have been a real estate investor. And at this point, they're getting older, they're ready to retire, but they don't want to forfeit all of that income. You know, they don't want to turn over all that income they were generating from a free and clear property, but they also don't want the headache anymore. So as an investor, you can actually come in, take the property off of their hands, um, and then, you know, create a note where they're still getting income. You're now getting income and everybody wins. So that's a pretty cool thing in my book. So how do you get it? Like I said, you got to, first of all, you got to find a property free and clear. Uh, you need to set terms, right? Interest rate, how long, you know, that person, the seller may say, well, look, I want my money in 10 years, you know, and, and obviously if you, if you finance a property over 10 years, then, you know, your, your monthly payment is going to be pretty high, which is, you know, it's nice because you'll get the property faster, but your, your out of pocket costs are going to be fairly high and your cash flow is going to be pretty low. So, but if you do it, you know, just go back and refinance the property after a certain amount of time. So you set your terms. What I mean by that is length. I talked about that earlier. Length, rates, even late fees, you know, all of that stuff. You got to specify um, in it. 
And then basically you would go and go to the closing, you know, with a promissory note purchase agreement. Um, you'd have all your different uh, things that go with it. You know, basically you got to do title search, all that kind of stuff, make sure there's no liens on the property. So very similar to the same process, but much quicker. So when I've gone to the closing table and seller financing, you know, my stack of papers was very small. When I went to the seller, to the closing table with conventional uh, closing, conventional financing, I signed my name a lot of times on my company on behalf of my LLC many, many times. So basically you find it free and clear, set terms, do negotiation, go to closing, you know, same process, right? I still got to get insurance, all those things still got to be put in place. So what are the benefits? Um, just like private money, you can be creative, which is nice, right? You can be creative. I have done seller finance deals that were uh, interest only payments for about two, three years, no prepayment penalties. You know, if I go and refinance the property quickly, then I can pay them out. I keep my interest rates, my interest costs low, um, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And I think, you know, so you can be very creative. You can have, you can set it up where you have no down payment, low or no down payment. And it really just depends. Like I say, it all falls under being creative. Um, I'd say these are typically quicker. Quick to close. And like, so creative, I'd say creative and flexible. And just like, you know, so there's also typically limited underwriting. from them and then it's also it is based on the deal and a win-win all right so all right so last let's talk about some of the cons of creative financing um, basically some of the cons that I've run into or I've heard about at least are uh, basically sometimes they can be harder to find In other words, they don't just jump out at you. You know, you got to work for them. You got to kind of look at it like mining for gold. You know, as you're talking and, and, and doing negotiations and things like that, you know, it, it takes a little bit more work to identify people who own a property free and clear. But as you market, as you talk to folks, you know, you can easily overcome these things. And I find them to be quite rewarding. So, but they can be a little bit harder to find. You're not just going to find these popping out on the internet. You're not going to find them on the MLS. So you got to look for them. Uh, the other thing is that you really kind of need to know what you're doing um, in terms of structuring a deal. So I will call that uh, knowledge or experience. They are needed, right? You know, so you typically, in terms of trying to negotiate this kind of deal, when you're talking to uh, an owner per se, you're not just going to come out and say, hey, you want to do seller financing right off the bat? You know, you, you got to work your way into that. You know, typically when you're looking for trying to identify what the seller is looking for, what their what we call motivation is, this is the time we can kind of bring up some of those things. But you don't typically just come right out because it's got to you got to create a win win. So um, it does take some knowledge and some experience needed. And when you're trying to negotiate, you got to present favorable terms and be able to structure a deal in such a way that it is attractive um, to that seller. Because typically a seller just wants to cash out. They just a lot of them just want to get their money uh, right off the bat. But the nice part is if they are in a scenario where they're not in a rush to get that money right off the back and they're willing to wait a little bit of time, you know, because really if they're willing to become the bank, both of you win. So both the investor and the seller can win in a seller finance situation because the seller, if they don't want their money right away, they can basically let's say for example they're trying to, you know, it's a hundred grand house. Hey, you you make two two and a half times what that amount is. So that's that's a pretty good win um, when you're doing these kind of deals. But you don't you, you got to kind of know how to lead into that, and you have to be able to find a person who's willing uh, willing to to invest or willing to sell under those kind of terms. So um, you know, really from the standpoint from the from the negative standpoint, those are some of the things that really jump out to me. Like I said, you do need some experience. You got to know you know how to how to set up the purchase agreement, you know, how to set up the terms and amortization schedule, how to present it in such a way that it is attractive. A lot of times when you're doing conventional financing per se, hey, you're getting a 25 year note, you're getting a 30 year note or a 20 year note, whatever that might be. And the terms are, terms are pretty much set by the bank. 
But with creative financing, you're able to go in and kind of create your own terms, something that works for both parties. So that's one of the reasons that I love it. I've used it on several deals uh, and it's been pretty beneficial to me. Uh, something that I plan on using every chance I get, I try to use seller financing. But again, they, they don't just they don't pop out at you right off the bat. But um, but again, 30 percent of people actually do own their homes uh, free and clear. So that's a pretty good uh, thing to just ask about uh, to lead into, you know, why you're uh, actually doing the deal. So. There you have it. Those are the four major types of, uh, of, of, of financing in real estate. There's conventional loans, hard money, we'll go over them again, private money, and then creative financing. I didn't really go into uh, subject twos and lease options on this deal. Uh, you know, I've, I've got some, some other friends who are much better at explaining those than I am. But as you get into the creative, the creative financing world, you can do really well. You know, and that's one thing I think every investor has to get into as time goes on because more deals come your way. And the problem you want to have is to have more deals than you have money because then you can be creative. You can go and find private lenders, you know, to front to basically provide funds for your deals and private money. People are great because, you know, they typically have the money, but not the time or the knowledge to invest in real estate. And you come with come together with them and create a win win. Or you can jump over in the um the creative financing side and getting the seller financing which is also phenomenal so um, i do have a couple of videos about talking about seller financing if you want to check those out and uh, they'll kind of explain what it is and, and how you actually get into it and, and go through the steps of it so like i said i wanted to walk you through just those basic tenets and i pray that this has been a blessing to you i hope you've learned a lot if you got any questions make sure you drop them in the, in the uh, comment section we'll make sure we get them answered really quick and uh and, and, and get you what you need to keep adding to your toolbox hey look this is marseille again the property pastor uh, cheering for you guys, wishing you nothing but the best. Um, thanks for tuning in today and uh, looking forward to uh, seeing you on the next video. God bless.